Well, today I want to start this uh, study on Ephesians. Ephesians is my favorite book. I'm just going to ooze and cry and try not to shout, but I want to, because this book, I think, is the essence of New Testament Christianity. But before I get into the book, I want to talk about a little bit about a proper way to approach the Bible, because I, I hear such horrible things in the name of God, and, and sometimes a Bible verse is quoted. Have you noticed how many politicians misquote or proof text the Bible during the election season? And they never even read the paragraph where the little phrase they quoted comes from. Now that's true for most Christians, I'm afraid. Most Christians I know have about 10 proof texts they base all their theology on, and they never even read the chapter that the verse comes in. And if you ask them something, they say, well, my mother told me. Well, your mother's wonderful, but she's not authoritative. Well, I better change that. But, um, <laughs> brothers and sisters, I want, to, I want to basically state my philosophy of Bible interpretation. That basically informs all the commentaries that I've written. And I've written a commentary, a detailed commentary, verse by verse, on every book of the Bible over my 55 years of ministry. I'm redoing some now because I, I really found out what it meant later. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> the only inspired person in Bible study is the original author. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. So no modern author, teacher, denomination is inspired. The only inspired person is the original author. So it just makes common sense. That for me to properly understand the Bible, I must go back to the who, what, when, where, why questions before I just jump in the Bible somewhere and say God said without even reading the whole book that I'm in. Because every book of the Bible is one unified message. Now, a little joke, and I think I told it last time I got to preach on Sunday with you. Let's say that... Your brother found a letter in the attic that you wrote 20 years earlier on Valentine's Day in junior high school to the girl you knew you couldn't live without. Five pages of ooey gooey, I love you forever, I'll climb any mountain, I'll cross. And he reads two sentences off the third page to embarrass you. You would say to him, wait a minute. You've got to know when I wrote that, who I wrote that to, why I wrote that, and you've got to read the whole letter. Do you hear God screaming that at us? Oh, how we abuse his word by picking out our favorite theological hobby horses, our favorite verses that back up our denominational idiosyncrasies, and ignore every other verse around it that doesn't quite happen to fit. Amen or oh me? Amen. We interpret the Bible, and it's like listening to half of a phone conversation. If you can really misunderstand the conversation if all you heard is one person speaking. You would have to hear the other side to understand the meaning of the words and sentences. So we have got to try to say, who wrote this? When did they write it? Who did they write it to? And why did they write it? Every New Testament book is an occasional document. That means there's something in the church, a crisis, a need, that caused a writer to write this book. And every book has a unified message. And it's not fair for us to pick little pieces out without reading the whole message. So, I usually say the parameters of this is the original author, their historical setting is the key, not yours, theirs. And the way you kind of know you're in the ballpark is what would have, could have, should have the first hearers or readers have understood. Now, there is the context of interpretation. So I, I want to make this radical statement. Every Bible passage has one and only one meaning. Now, I know you just said, yeah, you think you got it. No. Every Bible passage has an intent. I've got to try to find that. Am I ever certain that I have it? No. But I've got to try to find that. And what would the original hearers have understood? 
Now, I bring this all up to say this, and I, I know this is shocking, and I had people really get mad at me, so, but I'm visiting, so don't do it. I mean, <laughs> if you never heard the word Gnostic, you cannot understand Ephesians, or Colossians, or 1 John, or possibly the Gospel of John. If you never heard the word Judaizers, you cannot understand the book of Galatians or Acts 15. And what I'm saying to you is there is an early church heresy behind these writings. If you're totally ignorant of the reason for the writing, there's no way you can understand the writing. Does that make sense? Yeah. So in your notes, there's a few pages in, but I want to talk about Gnostics just for a minute. Now, this is the early church fight for the first 300 years. There was no other major problem than this. Now, you're familiar with this from the Da Vinci Code movie a few years ago, which was based on the Gospel of Thomas, which is a non-canonical Gnostic gospel, by the way, from Ethiopia. We don't even have it in Greek. It's only in Coptic. But it is this philosophy that developed in the first century that began to have its own teachers and writings in the second century that influences the understanding of both Colossians and Ephesians. Now, here's what they did. At first, it doesn't sound so radical until you recognize the implications of this. They believe that spirit is good and matter is evil, and they are both co-eternal. Think what I just said. God didn't create matter. Matter has always existed. God has always existed. One is good, one is evil. If you know anything about Greek, Greek literature, they would say the body is the prison house of the soul. They would attribute evil to physicalness. So they come to the person of Jesus and they say, he is fully God, but he is not really man. And you say, well, what, is, what does that do? Well, it's kind of... You know, 1 John 4, 1 through 3, it says, if you don't believe Jesus is fully God and fully man, you are of the little a antichrist spirit. That's 1 John 4, 1 through 3. Now, in our day, this heresy is flipped. Uh, God spell, Jesus Christ superstar. We don't mind saying Jesus is a man at all. We just deny his deity as a society. So it's the same heresy, it's just flipped. Now, this is a major problem to the New Testament where Jesus is presented as the incarnate, visible, invisible God. So they have, they have just decimated the person of Christ theology. Secondly, how is someone saved? Now you and I would say, through the death of Christ, the wooing of the Spirit, the empty tomb, us trusting by faith, repentance and faith. No, 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 not these guys. They would say, if God is holy, he cannot interact with matter, which is evil. So between a high God is a series of angelic levels they would call eons. And salvation is really knowing the secret password to get through each of these levels of heaven to get back to an impersonal God. Now guess where you find these passwords? Only in their group. This is the ancient form of Scientology. Our group's got the answer. If you give us a lot of money, we'll give you the, we'll give you the truth. No, no. And this was an elite group that said, we only want the wealthy and educated. Yeah, you can come join our group, but only a select few of you. Now, they claim that Jesus, during the time from the resurrection to the ascension, 40 days, gave them secret oral knowledge that they're going to pass on. The minute any teacher says to you, he has secret knowledge, run! Because there's nothing secret about the New Testament. Amen? Amen. It's all on the surface, and it's for whosoever will. So here we have, they've destroyed the person of Christ, and they've destroyed the work of Christ. But they use Christian vocabulary. They were in Christian meetings. Think of 1 John 2, 18 and 19. They went out from us because they were not of us. That's the Gnostic group. They were in the church. They were using our meetings for their own reasons and yet claiming to be Christian. Now that is the background 
of Colossians. And Ephesians is a developed form of the outline of Colossians as a cyclical letter to all the churches of Western Turkey, which they would call Asia Minor. Now that is a brief introduction of where I'm going. But I want, I want to say quickly to you, do you see why I'm saying up front that this is an occasional document? And if you don't know the who, what, when, where, you cannot understand the document. People always say to me, pick in my church, I used to do, before I go verse by verse through books, I used to go verse by verse through New Testament on Sunday night and verse by verse through Old Testament on Wednesday night and preach through unified topics like the Upper Room Discourse or Letters to the Seven Churches or Sermon on the Mount, something like that, because literary context is crucial. So what I'm saying here, before you come to a Bible book, before you pick up the Bible, I think first of all we've got to pray. Because we approach a holy book, every one of us, with dirty hands. Lord, please help me understand this. Lord, please forgive me. Lord, fill me with your spirit. Now this is a prerequisite to understanding the Bible. Why? Because this is a spiritual book that you can't bring just human intellect to. So I hope you prayed before you come. And brothers and sisters, I hope you prayed for me. I mean, it's just crucial. Did you come to be entertained? Or did you come to hear the Spirit speak to your heart? Now, I'm not saying what I say is the Spirit, but I'm saying every one of us came not for just more information so we can win on Wheel of Fortune. No, no, no. We're here to have our life changed because we believe this book is the only clear self-revelation of the one true God. Amen? Amen. This is serious stuff. And I think we take it rather flippantly in our day. So first of all, I know I'm preaching to the choir. Thank you for being here. Pat, thank you for letting me come. Staff, thank you for letting me come. Because I can slap Christians and I can go home. <laughs> and they need to be slapped. Because we're lazy. Proof text. Denominationalist. Someone once said to me, well, all bad disbelief. That is the stupidest statement I ever heard in my life. We don't believe on breathing, much less the Bible. So I'm going to hold your foot to the fire. I think it's fair for you to ask for me, or me to ask for you. Can you show me in the Bible where you got that? That's not ugly. That's saying this is our source of authority. If you're claiming that you're speaking for God and sharing his truth, do I have the right to say, can you show me? Or does my degree or my black suit or the pulpit give me the right to say anything I want to? You've got to challenge those who you read and hear. Can you show me in the Bible? Then you've got to take the time to pray, research what you have, right? Because we're different. And by the way, I think the plurality in the church is not a weakness but a plus. Because there are people that I could talk to that you couldn't talk to. But I'm smart enough to know there are people you could talk to that would never, never, never listen to me. But you is what, through your experience, through your education, through your, your uh, particular expertise, you have an inroad to people about the gospel of Christ. The plurality allows us to reach the plurality of lost people that are connected to our lives. So disagreement is not a problem. Attitude's a problem, but disagreement's not a problem. I'm over that now. Okay, let's go to your notes. I will use your note, my notes, um, and here's what I'm going to use them for real quickly. I just made some opening statements about hermeneutics. It's just the Greek word hermeneueo, to, ways to interpret or understand. I'm going to say there are six items that I'm going to try to give you to say this is why I believe this. Now, I cannot back up everything I say with all six items, but you're going to notice in the commentaries these things. Number one, I'm trying to trying to deal with the historical setting of the author and the hearers. I am trying to show you the literary context. How far does this passage on one subject go? I'm trying to do that. I'm going to try to give you grammatical features. Uh, if, if it's just it happened, which is aorist indicative, no flag. If there's another form, the author himself is flagging, I want to say this with this extra thought. Then I'm going to try to give you lexical options of how this word was used to the people who first read it. 
Now, when you go to a dictionary and you look up a word, those one, two, three, four, A, B, C, D, those are ways that that root is used in different contexts. Yes? And when you look at all those ways, you've got to decide which one fits this literary context best. So that's the lexical option. Then I'm going to try to say, what kind of genre is it? Is it prophetic? Is it apocalyptic? Is it law? And tonight, the rest of the time, we're going to do the letter. So this is epistolary form. And then finally, I'm going to do parallel passages. Because the best interpreter of an inspired book is an inspired book. Now, I'm not just looking for the number of times the word appears. I'm looking as a teacher for the clearest teaching passage on this subject so I can understand the other passages that are not so clear. So that is the information you're going to see in my notes when we get into the verse-by-verse -verse study. Today, in this time frame, I need to do the introduction because I said how important that is and how often we forget that. Okay? So please look at my notes if you would. If you have them, if someone next to you has a set, they'll share it with you. This opening statement is meant to show you how important Ephesians is. Uh, I think that to this group, many of you are older, so you'll know the name Samuel Coleridge. He's a famous English poet. Would you look what he said about Ephesians? This is the most divine composition of man. What a radical statement from a well-known English poet. Oh my goodness, what kind of book must Ephesians be? Did you know this was John Calvin's favorite book? Because of chapter 1, verse 4. <laughs> Do you also know that in the word John Knox, the famous Presbyterian preacher, do you know on his deathbed, he asked that Calvin's sermons on Ephesians be read to him as he passed from this life? Does this tell you something of how this book has impacted? Now, number two, just think with me for a minute. The doctrinal books of Paul begin with Galatians. I mentioned to you the Judaizers. That's where Paul began to lay out his understanding of what Jesus said to him on the Damascus Road, what Ananias revealed to him as God's truth, and then as he developed it working in, in his area of person. Now, that is later comes into the book of Romans. Uh, Galatians truths are brought into a presentation of what Paul's gospel is in Romans. So a church he had never met, the Roman church, knew what he was saying because there's so much bad press about Paul and he wanted that church to help him go to Spain. So Romans, major, major biblical truth. Ephesians is a summary of Romans. Ephesians is the capstone of Paul's theology. Oh my, what a major book, the capstone of Paul's theology. When people, excuse me, ask me to come and preach and say, what do you want to preach on? I say Ephesians. There are five, at least five messages in Ephesians that I believe are desperately needed by the modern church. I have really prayed because the tendency of me as a professor is to get too detailed. And what I really want to do is not miss these major truths by getting in the weeds too far. So I'm going to give you a chance to ask me questions, hopefully at the end of every session almost. If I overstate something or misstate something, or you have a question, I didn't state it well, please ask me so I can restate it or give you a chance to express your understanding of it. Because this is major, major, non-compromisable Christian truth. And I'm so honored to get to share it with you. Now, I'm not going to go over authorship with you. You can see a detail in my notes. I try to show you the early church and the dates for the people who, it says it's a Paul. The first person to doubt it is Erasmus. Um, that's going to be, you know, Erasmus that put out the first Greek New Testament, so the Reformation time. And there is some differences in this book. Uh, it's surprising. Um, this, is, this, you know, Colossians, the first one I'm going to show you, is very short sentences right in the face of the false teachers. Ephesians is the only book of Paul that has these long, long, long sentences. Very unusual. In Colossians, the second coming is immediate. In Ephesians, the second coming is delayed. In Colossians, the church is local. In Ephesians, the church is universal. Now, this is rather surprising, but it's Paul writing to a different group for a different purpose. 
Therefore, the vocabulary is changing some, and therefore the style is changing some. But the theology is Paul's. And the vast majority of the early church never doubted Paul's authorship. There are people today that doubt everything. So we just got to be careful of that. Now, number three, this literary relationship between Ephesians and Colossians, I am not going to go over that in detail, but I have this page after page of this. If you're the kind of person that wants the detailed information, I want to show you that the vast majority of Colossians is repeated in Ephesians. So the outline we find in Colossians, with some exception, is going to be the outline that fits in Ephesians. Now you say, well, is that really important? It's crucial, my brothers and sisters. Let me illustrate that quickly. All of Paul's letters, for the most part, break into two halves. A doctrinal section that addresses the issue for the, the reason that he's writing and how to apply that section. That's true of Ephesians. 1 through 3 is doctrinal, 4 through 6 is practical. Now think with me. If the Gnostic false teachers are claiming human intellect, human performance as the key to understand the gospel and be saved, do you think Paul is going to counteract that with major doctrinal truths that have nothing to do with human beings' participation? So think of Ephesians 1 through 3. The first part that I'm going to deal with in the worship service is this great prayer to the Trinity, and it's basically about predestination, that which human beings have nothing to do with. The definitive passage on grace is chapter 2, 1 through 10. It is the text on the unmerited, undeserved love of God. Beginning in 2.11 through 3.13, is the mystery of God hidden from the ages, but now revealed in Christ that Jew and Gentile are now one. Something human beings have nothing to do with. If I did not know the background, I couldn't see the exciting doctrinal thrust of the first three chapters, which depreciates the place of the human and accentuates the place of Jesus. And that's what this is going to do. Okay, with that in mind, let me go on over. I'm going to skip several pages because I try to show you all these words and phrases that are the same. So let me do the summary, number four. Over one-third of the words in Colossians are in Ephesians. It has been estimated that 75 of the 155 verses in Ephesians have a parallel in Colossians. Now, notice what follows. Both of these books were delivered by Tychicus. They were sent to the same area, Asia Minor. They deal with the same Christological topic. They emphasize Christ as the head of the church. Only in Ephesians and Colossians is Christ called the head of the church. Only. Unique. Both encourage appropriate Christian living. Oh, how do we need to hear that, right? It's not some prayer you prayed 35 years ago that's a key to you being right with God. It's how you live today. Eternal life has observable, contemporary characteristics. I don't care how high you jump. I don't care how many goosebumps you got somewhere away in the past. If you don't talk to him today, trust him today, and try to please him today, there's a question mark over your relationship. We're not saved by how we live, but how we live are the evidence that we have been saved. Uh, major points of dissimilarity. Just quickly, I want to touch that. I, I mentioned some of these. Is it surprising to you the local church in Colossians and the universal church in Ephesians? I thought I saw many of you brought your Bibles. Thank God for a church that has adult Bible study and where there are people bring their Bibles. Uh, the rest of you brought your uh, phones or iPads, and I know you look it up on there. So would you please look at Ephesians one just for a minute? Ephesians one one. Now, hopefully, as a serious Bible student, you have a study Bible. And not just the white one you got at your wedding. You can't read it, it's so good. Would you see in the margin of 1-1 one, one, where it says at Ephesus, and I'm using New American Standard, and it says in the margin, some ancient manuscripts omit in Ephesus. Now, that's, that's an understatement. All ancient manuscripts miss in Ephesus. The grammatical structure can accommodate a place name. There may even have been a blank in the original Greek manuscript. Now, what are we saying here? This was not written to a specific church. This was written to many churches. 
And the churches it was written to is on the Roman postal route that is seven churches. The very ones you know from the book of Revelation is the Roman postal route that this was written, given to. And this book was meant to be read in every one of those churches. And their name was meant to be supplied in verse 1. Matter of fact, in the book of Colossians, where it says, the letter to the Laodiceans, many of us have said, we don't have a letter to the Laodiceans. Did we lose one of Paul's letters? It's probably the book of, and we know it's the book of Ephesians, traveling to Laodicea, one of those seven places on that postal route. So Ephesians is a cyclical letter. So there's, it's not surprising that he can't use a local church designation, the church at Colossae, the church at Philippi. Can't do that. So what does he do? He uses the universal aspect of ecclesia, the universal church. And that's one of the ways we know this is a cyclical letter. This is the only cyclical letter I know, except maybe for James, which is another cyclical letter. And cyclical letters are very rare in the first century. So this was something unique that Paul did. Um, notice uh, I mentioned the heresy here, Gnostics number two. Uh, there are several key words through here that Paul slightly changes the meaning of. Boy, when I see Paul, I'm going to slap him. Don't you know? Can't you use the same definition of these words? No, they don't. And you don't either. You don't use the same word the same way, do you? I remember I was in India one time and pastors met me and I said, I'm just tickled to death to be here. And they said, we're so sorry. The, the Indian just went, oh, I'm all ears. They went, really? <laughs> we, we talk in funny ways and yet we force the Bible into a literalism that no language was ever forced into. So what I'm saying to you is, particularly a couple of them that you might want to see. Now, I'm not really trying to do an ad, but I need to tell you more information. What I'm doing in these notes is a college level. If you see this online where I have blue links to special topics, that's going to be a seminary level. Because these issues, I lay them out completely in one or two pages. Now, one of the issues that I'm going to lay out, which you have to be online to see it, is the word mysterion or mystery. Paul uses it in 13 different ways. Holy moly. But basically all have one connotation. The consummation of a believer's faith. So, yes, it's true. The word mystery in, in Colossians is used one way. The word mystery in Ephesians is used another way. In my opinion, that's not the sign of two authors. It's the sign of Paul addressing different groups for different purposes. And you have to decide what you think about that. Um, I am surprised that this uh, wonderful hymn of the co uh, cosmic nature of Jesus Christ found in Colossians 1, oh, what a beautiful poem that is, is not in Ephesians. I'm surprised that uh, Ephesians talk about the Trinity so much is not in Colossians. So there is a difference between these two, but I think they're by the same author at the same time. Um... Yeah, I mentioned number six. It basically says that. If you're interested in what I just did, you can look through that. and I give you the references. You can always check me. I hope you will. As far as the date, this is one of the prison letters. Paul's in prison. Paul's in prison several times. We're assuming this is scholarly opinion. This is not, I can prove it from a text. Most of us think that this is the Roman imprisonment in the early 60s. Now, I think Paul was released from prison wrote the pastoral epistles and was rearrested and killed sometime around 65 or at least before Nero killed himself in 68. So this is what the early Roman imprisonment of Paul. And then we have several letters in the New Testament, four of them that were probably written at the same time of this imprisonment. Um, <clears throat> you notice that in your notes beginning under date number five, I have tried to, as best as I can, give all of Paul's books, the date they were written, the place they were written from, and their relationship to Acts. So this depends on what kind of Bible study person you are. If you're interested in how Paul's epistles fit into Acts, and how, this is just speculation, how scholars think this book appeared first. So Ephesians is going to be much later. I mean, Paul's already written Galatians and Thess both Thessalonians. He's already written a uh, other books here, you can see it. Corinthians, Romans, those all come before these prison letters. 
under recipients. I'm going to say to you that this is the church in the western end of Turkey. And these churches were so glad to get a letter from Paul. Many of them quickly tried to copy it. And that's when they got so many lousy early copies of the Greek New Testament. Because these churches tried to get it down quick before they passed it on. So just because a manuscript is early doesn't mean it's good, unfortunately. But this, this is the key. These letters were so important. In the early church, two groups of what we know the New Testament circulated early. The four Gospels, which they call the Gospels, and the letters of Paul. And those were the two main groups that circulated before the New Testament was cast as we know it. Now, what is the purpose? Well, if you have your Bibles open, I think there are two. If we had to give a purpose for Colossians, I would say the cosmic lordship of Jesus Christ. If I had to give one theme for Ephesians, it would be the unity of all things in Jesus Christ, which I get from chapter 1, verse 10. And then chapter 4 is, of course, the unity chapter. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one on. So this, the key is unity here to a church that's been disrupted uh, by false teachers. Now, number two is this doctrinal section. And uh, this is some of the things I mentioned to you, the Trinitarian nature of God. And what I'm going to try to do this morning in the worship service is at verses 1 through 14. Really, 3 through 14 is one sentence, and we shouldn't break it up. It ought to go together. And then the gracious character of God, which I mentioned to you, is chapter 2, the definitive passage, one sentence, 1 through 10, I will try to do tonight. And then the eternal redemptive plan, and that's chapter 2, 11 through 3, 13. And I, I want to say this again. People always ask me as a theologian, and I, I know many of you, have, we have different opinions on, on uh, systematic theologies and favorite authors and all that. So people always ask me, can you tell me, Bob, the integrating center of your theology? Where are you coming from? And that's a fair question for you to ask me. Um, I try not to answer it, but I, it's a fair question. <laughs> if I had to characterize who I am, I am a Great Commission evangelical. The thrust of my message is that God's heart beats for a lost world. And that when Jesus died, he died for the sin of the world. You hear where I'm coming from? So basically, the, the special topic that lays out my presuppositions, that the lens through which I view every text, it's important you see where I'm coming from. So if you agree with me here, you'll probably agree with much that I say. If this is a radical a difference from you, then you'll have to question what I say, and that's fine. All I ask you to do is look it up from the Bible and let me ask you, can you show me where you got that? Amen? So here's the link. Yahweh's eternal redemptive plan. That's the link. And I go back to Genesis 3.15 because I think that's referring to all humanity because there is no Israel till chapter 12. And even at the giving of the law, pardon me, Exodus 20 and Exodus 19, it says, and all the world is mine. And even in the call of Abraham, back in Genesis chapter 12, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed through you. Now I'm going through, I'm in this special topic, I'm going to give you every text and every prophetic text that deals with a universal invitation and a universal salvation provided in God's coming Messiah. And I am committed to that. And when I stand up and preach, I want to be able to say, whosoever will may come. I love all, as many as, whosoever. I'm committed to it. I can't live without it. Because I believe the only thing that keeps anybody from being saved today is not sin, but unbelief. <laughs> End of Revelation. The Spirit says come. The bride says come. Come. It's open. The door is wide open in Christ. Now, if, you're, if you are a theological person, you know where I'm coming from. If you're not, it's probably better. <laughs> The brief outline, I've given you a detailed outline, and the reason this is important is I'm trying to show you how literary units are crucial in understanding the Bible. And what we tend to do, because of our love for the Bible, is pull a verse out of context, put our definition on the words, and say, thus saith the Lord. And that is terribly inappropriate. We call that proof texting. You can do that to any doctrine. One of the things that I, I remember sitting in the classroom of Bill Hendricks in Southwestern Seminary 
and him saying this, it was like a lightning hit my mind. Because I love the word of God. And it looks like the Bible says this over here. And it says exactly opposite over here. But I love the Bible. Which do I choose? Which do I choose? And he said, the reason that Westerners don't understand the Bible is that we are Greek thinkers and the Bible is an Eastern book. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Now what does that mean? Easterners present truth different from Westerners. We're used to major premise, minor premise, logical conclusion, give me a placard of propositional truth. That is not how these Eastern guys presented it. They're going to give you stories. They're going to give you long historical accounts. They're going to give you paradoxes. They're going to give you parables. And these paradoxes are what Westerners are uncomfortable with. Do you believe in once, saved, always saved? Or do you believe you must persevere to the end? Do you believe you're elect? Or do you believe there's free will? I could do every doctrine that way. And the different denominations line up their proof text under each one. I'm, I am screaming now. <laughs> you do not have the right as a believer to let one inspired text damage or depreciate another inspired text. You must somehow hold them together. And what Eastern literature does is not cause us to pick A or B, but to live in the tension between A and B. And see, we want an easy, easy rule. And this is the tension of spiritual life. I've just given you a major truth, and you look like a cow at a new gate. <laughs> It's a good cow. It's a brown man or something. Like <laughs> you can see on my notes the mess is a philosophical discussion about Gnosticism. I tried to lay that out as best as I can. Um, I, I do think you cannot understand this text unless you have some knowledge of the Gnostic background. And one of my friends said to me, are, are you telling me that I can't understand the Bible without doing historical research? That is what I'm saying. No, that's what I'm saying. Well, I pray and I pick it up. Okay, you pray and pick it up. And how many people in this group would agree the same thing you believe about that verse you just picked out on the trail? No, no. If it is true that the original author is the only inspired person, and it is true he wrote to a church for a specific purpose, and it is true that i got to read the whole message before I tear it in little parts that I like, how far are we from proper Bible study? And is there an English teacher here? I'm good. If, I, if I make a bomb statement, you please correct me, okay? Honestly. When we, you remember in high school when they told you that every paragraph has one topical thought or one topical sentence? Remember that? Now, unfortunately, there is no textual marker for paragraphing, either in Hebrew or Greek. But what your Bible has done is put verses together, which are no verses really either. That's all also uninspired. Put these sentences together that deal with the subject, and that turns into a paragraph. And I, I'm going to start with you by this, but I think it's true. The smallest bit of the Bible we should ever try to interpret is at paragraph level. Never at verse level, never at clause level, never at word level. Because it's the paragraph that's communicating the author's intent. And we can get carried away with our own personal preferences and our own denominational distinctives if we go off on tangents with half a verse. Okay. Now I've got 15 minutes left or so. And I have tried to slap you. I really have tried to slap you. Thanks <laughs> for goodness. And I hope you realize why. People say to me over and over, why have I never heard this before? And that's a good question. I remember the uh, BSN at uh, Texas Tech asked me to come one time. They said, now, Bob, we want you to speak on Baptist distinctives. I said, I'd just soon throw up. <laughs> <laughs> if, they are if they are Bible truths, why in the world would I call them Baptist distinctives? And if they're not Bible truths, why in the world would I teach it? Where is the priority? Your traditions... Your personal preferences are this book. Where is the authority in your life? 
your experience, your school, your church, your family, your personality type. There's one source for faith and practice. One source. It's not Bob. It's not Kingwood. It's not Texas. Amen? Amen. And why are we neglecting this? Why are we letting people tear this apart in God's name and us never having a problem with it? Why are we reading those crazy authors that say things here that nobody in the whole church ever thought before? What's the matter with us? We are herd people in Western society that are so lazy, we never pick up the Bible and read it for ourselves. And with that, I'll open it to questions. Thank you.